I'll be Sabbath again, church family. And um, I do want to remind everyone that, uh, as, as Pastor mentioned, we are community engaged. Um, I have been going into the nursing, one of the nursing homes and, and speaking and having services on Sundays uh, throughout the whole pandemic. So if there's anybody interested in that, um, I definitely want to <laughs> invite you to join me or, or be a part of it. Um, because it's been an amazing uh, ministry. Uh, uh, the Harris, I've kind of adopted it or, or participated in it with the Harris family, and I've seen people really come to know Christ in a nursing home. And so if there's anybody interested, I just want to lift that up as well, as well as invite you all to prayer meeting. If you're missing prayer meeting on Wednesday night, you're missing a lot. And some of you are going through things, and Jesus says that some things come only by prayer and fasting. And so if you're missing prayer meeting, I want to challenge you in this new year to at least commit to coming to prayer meeting physically once a month. How many times a month? I didn't say all every Wednesday night. I said one Wednesday night a month. You will not be sorry if you come to prayer meeting. You burdens are lifted at Calvary. And when we pray together as a family on a Wednesday night, special things begin to happen. So I wanted to just throw those two things out there um, for people to join us. Uh, as we do these things. So we're going to continue in our series on the health message. This is the 10th installment. Not all of them were done during Sabbath. Alex is kind enough to meet me here at night sometimes, and we've done a few supplements, and we're going to probably do a couple more. Uh, but we're getting towards the end of it, and we're going to get right into it. We have a lot to cover today. Um, so let's go to the Bible. As um, uh, young uh, uh, Nate Tompkins read so well, and um, I, God's hand is on that young man. Um, I think he's going to be a preacher. So we're going to, Pastor, we got to keep encouraging him. Um, 1 Corinthians chapter 9, we're going to read verses 24 through 27. One of my favorite Bible passages is right here. The Bible says, Know ye not that they which run in a race run all, but one receives the prize. So run that you may obtain. And every man that strives for the mastery is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. Paul goes on and he says in verse 26, I therefore so run, not as uncertainly, so fight I, not as one that beats the air. But I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest that by any means when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. A message this Sabbath exercise, health in movement, the health message part 10. Father God, we thank you for this opportunity to study your word. And I ask once again, Lord, that you make me just a nail upon the wall, a rusty, sorry nail. And I ask in a special way, Father God, that you hang a portrait of Jesus Christ upon that nail. Lord, let Eric Walsh not be seen nor heard. Instead, Father, let us hear a word from the throne room of grace. This is our prayer in Jesus' precious and holy name. Amen. So last time we met, we talked about New Year's resolutions and that like eight, I think I, think I said like 8% of people actually continue more than like 10 days or something like that. So that's why this one is good to come so late in January. Amen. Um, we're going to go to the book of Deuteronomy chapter 34. And I'm going to read the story of the end of Moses' life. A very powerful story, as is the whole life of Moses. Remember, Moses was chosen from when he was a child. He was such a threat um, that uh, it was sought that he would be killed before he was even born. He was adopted by Pharaoh's daughter. And yet, God worked it out so his biological mother could teach him the truth and Moses grew up understanding that it would one day be his job to liberate the Hebrews. At the age of 40, Moses sees one of his uh, brothers being mistreated. And do you remember what Moses did? Moses killed the Egyptian who was mistreating him and buried his body in the sand. I always say Moses was a bit gangster. Um, and when they found out what Moses did, Moses had to run and flee. Moses spent the next 40 years of his life mining sheep and learning from God to be patient. He also learned during that time 
how to commune with God. And he, although the first 40 years prepared him to be Pharaoh or a great general of Egypt, the second 40 years humbled Moses and prepared him to be a servant of God. So when Moses, ah, don't miss this, when Moses is called to work for God, to finally liberate his people, he is 80 years of age. When we jump to the story here, Moses is now 120 years of age. And here's what the Bible says in Deuteronomy 34 and verse 1. And Moses went up from the plains of Moab unto the mount, uh, mountain of Nebo to the top of Pisgah that is over against Jericho. And the Lord showed him all the land of Gilead and Dan, unto Dan and all Naphtali and the land of Ephraim and Manasseh and the, all the land of Judah unto the utmost sea and the south and the plain of the valley of Jericho, the city of palm trees unto Zoar. Moses, you remember last time we talked, he had struck the rock when he was supposed to speak to the rock. Uh, he disobeyed God. And, and in his frustration dealing with the people, his punishment was, some argue it wasn't a punishment, it was really, some people say, well, it was his chance to, to get a break from the labors he had done for 40 years, but his punishment was he would not enter the promised land for which he had led the, peop uh, the, peop the children of Israel and had marched around in the wilderness for 40 years. On the precipice of finally entering the promised land, Moses is able at 120 years of age to climb a mountain. You might, you might miss that in the story. He literally climbs a mountain as his last, his last act isn't striking the rock. His last act is climbing a mountain. That's some serious exercise. And the Lord said unto him, this is the land which I swear unto Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, saying, I will give it unto your seed. I have caused thee to see it with thine eyes, but thou shalt not go over thither. So Moses, the servant of the Lord, died there in the land of Moab, according to the word of the Lord. So that's where Moses dies, on the top of a mountain at 120 years old. Here's what the Bible says. And he buried him in a valley. Who buried Moses? God did. Spirit of prophecy says it was the angels. God buried him in the valley in the land of Moab over against Beth Peor, but no man knows of his sepulcher unto this day. So he buried him, and, it, and we are told by the inspired pen that this happened so that the children of Israel would not be tempted to go to his burial site and make a shrine of it. And Moses was a, look at this, this verse is the key verse for our message today, verse 7. And Moses was 120 years old when he died. His eye was not dim, nor his natural force abated. When Moses died, he didn't need glasses. When Moses died, he could still project his voice and speak. When Moses died, he could still climb a mountain. Moses did not die of old age. Moses died when God said it was time for him to die, but Moses' strength existed. One of the secrets to him being able to climb, this is a picture from the top, Mount Nebo in modern day um, Jordan. You can see how high he would have had to climb because he came from down in the bottom of that valley. This is showing you all that you can see. They, they, they have a, a, a plaque here. So you can see all of the places that Moses would have been able to see um, uh, from the sea all the way up here. That's the Dead Sea. It would have been an incredible climb up that mountain. But you have to remember that Moses had been walking for 40 years. Not only that, do you remember the story when the Amalekites came against them and they attacked the weakest members of the, of the house of Israel in the back, the elderly and the, and, the, and the most sickly, and they attacked and God was upset and Moses had to hold his hand up and every, as long as his hand was up, uh, Joshua would win the fight. But if he got tired and his hand dropped, uh, they would lose the fight. You remember that? Moses was able to hold his hand up for a long time. And then uh, uh, her, uh, her and I think Aaron helped hold his hand up for him and they won the battle. Moses was always in action. Probably one of the key hallmarks of, li of Moses' life after 80 is that he never was standing still. 
So precious to God was Moses that I have to throw, every time I talk about this, I have to throw this verse in because I think it's powerful. One of the reasons they never found a sepulcher and one of the reasons uh, Moses is who he is is in, found in the book of Jude, which has one chapter. Verse 9 says, Yet Michael the archangel, when contending with the devil, he disputed about the body of Moses. Darest not bring against him a railing accusation, but said, The Lord rebuke thee. The devil came to claim Moses as his own and say that you can't take his body. But Jesus came and actually resurrected Moses and took him to heaven. I mean, it was a cosmic battle over the body of Moses, and Christ won. How do we know that Moses was resurrected? Where's the proof in the Bible? The proof is on another mountain. It is the, called the Mount of Transfiguration, where Moses and Elijah come and visit Jesus while he's on earth. The Spirit of Prophecy says, had Moses not struck the rock, he would have entered the promised land with them, and he would have been transfigured into glory. But I say all of this to tell you that one of the hallmarks of one of the sharpest, most humble, uh, most clear-minded prophets and Bible writers, uh, Moses himself, who wrote uh, several books of the Bible, was that he was always in motion. He didn't even stay in the grave long. So today we talk about exercise, one of the key things that we need to talk about if we're going to really understand our health message. So remember we started going backwards. I said when we talked to the church about the, the, um, the New Start program and the the aspects of our health message, we started with why, the why of the health message. We'll t touch on that again today. But the first thing is trust in God. The second one is rest, air, temperance, sunlight, water, and then we get to exercise. And the last couple of talks will be on nutrition. Uh, but you need trust in God in order to be able to do this other stuff. That's why I start with trust in God. Um, so let's talk about exercise. So one of the things that's changed from when many of us were kids here in the United States is that they've begun to reduce physical education. Many of the schools, in order to, to, Im to improve test scores over the last 30, 40 years, have actually reduced the time that children learn PE, which when I was in elementary school, was personally my favorite class. Um, <laughs> we played basketball, we even used to jump on a trampoline. I think they've outlawed that now because they realize just how dangerous that is, but I'm so glad I was able to do it when I was a kid. And, and we had so much fun. What we are learning, and you're going to see from this talk, is that you cannot be a top-notch student or learn, or learn at, at peak performance if you do not exercise. So when you pull PE out of the school in order to raise grades, what they found is that the schools that actually enhanced physical activity, their students increased their grade scores. So why is that important? This is the American Heart Association put out um, um, this from their news. They say most of the nation's teens aren't getting enough exercise. And so most teens aren't. And why do you think that might be? The world has totally changed. You got social media, you got Netflix. I mean, when I was a kid, I wanted to watch a TV show. I had to wait till it came on. I mean, I literally had to wait the whole week. And if I missed it, I'd have to hope I catch a rerun in the summertime. Like, I, I had no control over when I'd see a TV show. And guess what that meant? We watched a whole lot less television. Because we'd rather be outside playing ball, playing tackle football, running around in the neighborhood, you know, snow, doing snowball fights, that kind of stuff. That's where we'd rather be outside doing that stuff. But today, there's so much to grab hold of our young people that exercise, physical, so they, they, what they, what they, what, and what's happened with video games is there is this deception in the mind that you're in motion because you're playing games now. It's not like Atari uh, when I was a kid and, you know, the thing was like moving back and forth like this and, you know, one little button you press and is all two-dimensional. They actually have video games where you're in the game and you're looking down the barrel of a gun. So you, your brain thinks you're in motion. I, don't miss this. So you're, dece you're, in a sense, you're deceived. All of the rush of adrenaline comes. All of the excitement that would come with real exercise comes, but there's no actual movement. So it disconnects motion in the brain. And so there's this, 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 this I believe what has happened is there's a cognizant dissonance that's happening in the mind of young people, especially those addicted to video games. The idea that you're moving when you actually are always standing still, or actually worse, laying still. 
78% of U.S. children do not meet exercise guideline report fines. I love this picture because it looks like there's, you know, there's only a couple boys in the class, but this one just seems so happy. 78% um, of U.S. children do not meet exercise guidelines. This was, there was a time when kids got too much. We walked to school. We, you know, we, we played at school. We came home. We played after school. Today, that just doesn't happen. And the world is a more dangerous place. Let's, let's be honest. There's, there are neighborhoods you live in where you're not going to send your child outside to exercise. But there are consequences to not exercising. Americans sit more than any time in history, and it is literally killing us. This is from Forbes magazine, not a health magazine. Forbes magazine. It says, it, it, it's, and look at what they say. Look at the, they say, tweet this. Two things that they say. It's not the act of sitting itself that will kill you, but the uh, uh, repercussions of moving too little. Sedentary jobs have increased 83% since 1950, according to the American Heart Association. So we are living in a time when we move less, we, we, we walk less, we, we lift less. You know, we don't do what we used to do physically, and it is impacting us. How is it impacting us? Well, the first thing is, and most important thing about exercise, is that it doesn't just grow muscle, it grows the brain. And I want you to get this because I want to go back to the message we did on the why of the health message. And remember that part of the why of the health message is a clarity of mind, an ability to, to perceive deception in the last days. Remember that Ro uh, Revelation chapter 7 tells us that um, there are four angels holding back the winds of strife. A fifth angel comes on the scene. And what does that fifth angel is, uh, do? It warns the others not to touch, harm the earth or the sea or the trees until the servants of God have been what? sealed in their foreheads. And we talked about the fact that this, the forehead is where the frontal lobe of the brain sits. This is where your, your personality sits, where your intellect sits, your reasoning powers. But most importantly, it is where your character resides. So anything that damages the frontal lobe affects your ability to be saved. Y'all missing this thing. That's what the Bible says to choose you this day whom you will serve. Salvation is a choice. And if you can't reason well, if you can't see deception well, you may choose wrong. Isaiah 118 says it like this. Come, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Right? So it is the reasoning. And all the reasoning happens here. That's why the seal of God only happens one place in the forehead, the frontal lobe of the brain. This mark of the beast happens in two places. It happens in the, in the forehead, in the frontal lobe, but you can also get the mark of the beast where? In your right hand, because you don't have to be intelligently thinking about it to follow the enemy into destruction. That's what the right hand represents, you just following. So you've got everything we do, we have to think about what am I doing to have the sharpest mind possible for God. In fact, the scripture says to have this mind in us that was also in Christ Jesus. So how does that happen? Well, Harvard Health Publishing says regular exercises changes the brain to improve memory and thinking skills. So does the devil want us to sit still? He absolutely does. He, doesn't, he wants it harder for you to remember Bible verses. Are you getting one? He wants it hard for you to remember, remember uh, Bible lessons. He doesn't want you to even learn from your mistakes. So he wants your mind not sharp. So how does it do it? Well, exercise works to help us learn by increasing norepinephrine, which is the, the, the kind of partner uh, 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 neurochemical to adrenaline. It's, it's noradrenaline. It's related to adrenaline. It cre increases attention. So when you work out, your brain is better able to focus. I believe... And I think the science is beginning to really back it, back it up, that much of what we now describe as attention deficit, hyperactivity disorder, where we are prescribing children powerful drugs like Ritalin, is actually because the mind has been so dulled that it can't focus on its own. And if you add together two things, inactivity and television in all of its forms, whether that's watching TikTok on your phone or, or watching actual television, all of it turns the brain down. And then you take that same child that has been watching TikTok where the videos change every couple seconds or TV where the frame changes every eight seconds and you sit them in front of a teacher in a school and you expect that child's gonna sit in front of a teacher who doesn't light up, doesn't blink, the frame doesn't change to pay attention, right? 
And then you say, well, he can't sit still, so he must have attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. And a lot of the teachers will recommend put the child on Ritalin. Why? Because the poor teacher's got too many kids in the class in the first place. Never mind having one that's too fidgety. Or 10 of them that are too fidgety. So that's norepinephrine. And remember, norepinephrine, when we talked about sleep, norepinephrine was one of the brain chemicals that when we sleep is important in sleep healing us from emotional trauma. The health message begins to come together, dovetails, and all the pieces begin to come together. When you exercise and increase norepinephrine during the day, it makes the work of emotional healing better when you sleep at night. Dopamine increases with exercise and it calms the brain. Dopamine is what is released when someone does nicotine or cocaine. That's the chemical that drives you towards that drug. And when you exercise, it actually helps you to manage dopamine and calm the brain. Serotonin, sometimes called the policeman of the brain, is what helps keep brain activity under control. So it keeps you from getting too anxious. So there, I know we have a number of, of a licensed therapists in, in, the, in, the, uh, in the congregation. One of the reasons that more and more medical doctors and people in, in mental health are beginning to realize that we need to prescribe exercise for many of the mental health conditions that people have. Studies show that it works as good as Prozac. Now watch this. Prozac is, belongs to a class of drugs called the uh, SSRIs. These are serotonin selective reuptake inhibitors. Their work is to leave serotonin in between the nerves so that is more available to calm you down, beat your anxiety, boost you from out of depression. We're finding that exercise does this better naturally. Sister White says this, letter 6, 1885, she says, the mind must be interested in the exercise of the muscles. The education of the youth, physical exercise must be combined with mental taxation. So you've got to, if you want to actually get kids where they need to be, you've got to stress their body. And I'm going to talk to you why stressing the body is so important. You've got to stress the body while at the same time you challenge them intellectually to learn. When you do the two things at once, the child develops what we call resilience. And they are a better able to deal with real life trauma later on. And they're also going to be far better at learning. So, but you gotta be interested in it. There's actually studies that show there's something about wanting to exercise that makes exercise even better. This is why what's important is the exercise you wanna do. So if somebody says, you know, tells me to take up skiing as an exercise, I'm not doing it. I don't wanna ski. I don't like hitting trees and stuff. I don't, I don't wanna try, I don't wanna see what happens when I fall off of a ski. But I'll go play some basketball. I'm not worried about twisting my ankle. I play ball all the time. You see, so you got to find things to do that you like doing. There's something powerful about just that, just as, as, as Sister White says. So why is all of this important? Well, there's a chemical, um, brain-derived natriuretic factor, BDNF, you see it here, which actually helps stimulate growth of the brain. And I, I want to I say this because it is critically important. In fact, we, we, are, we, we were told, I was told in medical school, that if you, or someone gets addicted to drugs or alcohol, that the brain can't heal. I'm gonna say that again. We were told that if you damage your brain, it can never heal. Fortunately, the science proves that what the Bible says is true. The Bible says that God promises that I will restore unto you the land that the locusts have stolen. That's a Bible promise. We now know how God does that for your brain. One of them is we talked about when we talked about sleep, sleep does that, allows the brain to, 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 to come back for the neurons, axons, dendrites, myelin sheets to work at peak performance, to grow back when you sleep. And you see here, because when you sleep, you have more of this B, uh, BDNF. But the other one is exercise. And the other one was water. We talked about this when we talked about water and hydration. But exercise does it. So when someone, when I talk to patients who are coming out of a life where they have been addicted, one of the key things I say, and, they, and I've had people break down in tears to me in the office and cry and say, Doc, I was on crystal meth, when, especially when I was living in Cali. I, I was on crystal meth and I lost so much. I don't think I'll ever have a sharp mind again. And I'd say, oh, I'm so glad to tell you there is more than just hope. There is evidence, amen, that if you do certain key things around what you eat and how much you move and how much you sleep, that in fact your brain can regenerate and it's because of this 
chemical in the brain that it is able to happen. You can see stress messes with the BDNF and brings it down. So you got to be able to manage stress. This is why trust in God is so important, right? Trust in God is your first buffer against stress. When I get stressed out, I call on God's name. We were, we were speaking in, in Washington State last week and we were coming down. We had to go up a mountain to where we went to preach way out in the sticks. And, and it was beautiful up there, but it took two and a half hours to get up there. And on the way down, it was, it was raining and cold and fog. I couldn't see from here to the first row. That's how thick the, I was using the ways on my phone to know where the curves in the road were because I was not missing that plane. When I was get stressed, I would do the deep, remember I told you, deep breathe, open the window a little bit, get a little fresh air, and I'd call on the name of God. And a peace would just come over me. I want to submit to you that as you pass through the fog of life, and as it seems you don't know which direction to go, as life becomes more and more difficult, sometimes our navigation is in our phone. It is the word of God. And as we call on God's name, he will lead us even when we can't see where we're going. That's the beauty of Christianity. Even when life is most difficult, God will lead you. He'll give you peace, lower your stress, which lowers your inflammation, which improves your health. And now we'll talk more about some of this stuff later on. Um, there's a 2007 study of a German researchers found that people learn vocabulary words 20% faster after the exercise than they did before exercise, and the rate of learning correlated with the BDNF levels. That's how important this is, and I'm gonna show you where you get it from. So it's in the hippocampus. The hippocampus is the part of the brain where memory happens, and so BDNF is important there. And remember, it's a natural, I'm gonna do a little bit of basic science, and then we'll, 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 we won't stay too deep. But I want you to see how, you know what the Bible says about us? I say it every time I do one of these. We are fearfully and wonderfully made. They want to explain this through evolution. They can't. It's too complicated, right? It's far too complicated. Watch this. So there's a thing called insulin-like growth factor, IGF-1, that when you exercise, uh, your muscles release it. And why do your muscles release it? Your muscles release it to tell the body, listen, we're, we need energy. We're running out of fuel. Send some glucose to us so that we'll have energy. So it, it sends this signal out. This helps to get glucose into, into your working cells. Then what happens is in the brain, it doesn't help with energy, but with memory. So the muscles, when they release this thing in your body, it gives your muscles energy so you can keep exercising. But in your brain, it does something very different, IGF-1. What it does, BDNF in the brain, brings the IGF-1 in, and the IGF-1 signals serotonin. That's why the reasons why exercise is good for your brain. Natural Prozac calms you down, and glutamate, which is the most important neurotransmitter, which energizes the brain. So your exercise literally triggers this, beating up, brings in the IGF-1, it then increases, the IGF-1 gets into your brain, and now guess what it does? It increases the BDNF. So the very substance that causes your brain to grow, that you, for, your, for your axons to grow, for your myelin sheaths to be stronger, increases your memory, happens when you exercise. You know how important memory is? It's so important that one of the Ten Commandments actually is an exercise in memory. The fourth commandment begins, remember. So, and not just that, the other thing that happens is a thing called vascular endothelial growth factor increases when cells sense a shortage of oxygen. So when you start working out, you get into anaerobic phase, your cells are saying we don't have enough oxygen, it releases VEGF. And this triggers the growth of new capillaries in the brain and the, and the body. So I want you to get this. VEGF probably allows the other growth factors into the brain and hence increases brain growth and development with exercise. So when your body, this is the connection between the mind and the body. We're going to talk more about this when we talk about food. What happens is as your body, as you work out and you starve your cells of oxygen, it releases VEGF. What VEGF tells the body to do is to make more capillaries. Why is that relevant? I'm gonna show you on your heart why it's relevant, but in your brain it's relevant because the better uh, uh, vascularized the brain, the harder it is to have a stroke. And you know, we tell people that they have Alzheimer's disease. Do you know that many times people are misdiagnosed with Alzheimer's disease because on aut autopsy they can't find the um, amyloid plaques that actually define Alzheimer's disease? That in fact what they had is what we call multi-infarct dementia. 
And what that is, is when you have tiny little strokes over the course of your life, and over time, the damaged areas of the brain begin to coalesce, and of course, turn off that part of the brain, and so you have dementia. Exercise grows the capillary so it's harder for that to happen. And it protects us against stress. One of the most important things exercise does is that it protects us against stress. And we, church, we live in a stressful environment. The world is stressful. Sometimes I think I should turn news off on my phone because I get a thing and I'm like, oh, that happened. That's terrible. And you're like, yeah, it takes a while to reset yourself after you find out there's been a mass shooting or something. Or like, the, the, you know, they found this guy in Idaho who killed the students and you, you start reading the stories and you're like, oh, how did he get, you know, you got to stop sometimes. Hey, wait a minute, I, I don't need to get dragged into the story because this has been prophesied. Exercise protects against stress. And so what you can see stress, one of the key things about stress and it's something we call it allostatic load when it gets to be too much, but it causes many problems, it changes the way um, genes are expressed. Um, the way, uh, and there's a lot of things that contribute to it. I won't get into that, except to say that in acute stressful situations, there's a release of adrenaline that increases concentration and heightens awareness. And when I was a kid, you know, you'd, you'd go uh, out into our neighborhoods, and my, I told you this story before, my grandparents lived in Hartford on Simpson Street, and when we would, you know, my grandfather would give us all a quarter, and we'd all run to the penny store. My cousin Brian would get a dollar, but I'm not upset about that. Um, and we'd go to the penny store on the corner and we'd buy all this candy. We were smart kids. We'd, we'd bring all of it back to the house at the same time. We'd lay it out on the table and watch the second half of the football game, right? But you had to get to the store. You had to jump through people's backyard. That's how we got there quickly. What's the problem with jumping into a backyard in the city? Dogs. And the worst part was this was a Jamaican black American neighborhood. So the poor dogs were eating like macaroni and cheese and grits and rice and peas and people giving the dog callaloo and whatnot. And so, you know, the dogs are upset as it is. They, they, they like not eating what it's. You land in the backyard and you look like a side of beef when you drop in the backyard. But God created us so amazingly, church, that there's a thing called the fight or flight response. And what happens is, from your HPA axis, what happens is a, adrenaline and cortisol are released. Your pupils dilate. You don't need to read small print, right? You need to see where this. Brutus the beast is lurking around in the yard. Your heart rate increases. Your respiratory rate increases. Your blood vessels that go towards your digestive tract, they constrict and send blood to your muscles so that you can run or you can fight. Your skin capillaries change so it's easier for you to sweat. Hair stands up on your body because of that. And your whole body transforms. And I could go on and on with all the changes that happen. And in a moment, you're able to run faster than you ever could. Even a dog is amazed at how fast you leave the backyard and jump the fence. He's just watching you. And then you land on the other side of the fence, you take a few deep breaths, and you keep walking to the store. The problem, church, living in America, living in the last days, is that it's as if we are constantly in the yard with a dog. We are in a constant state of fight or flight. And this is not the topic for today, but this is why who you marry matters. They are missing this thing. This is why it matters where you work, that you prepare yourself for life. Because if you inject yourself into long-term stress, it will shorten your life. Everything from tests, so this is what happens to kids when they take tests, it's called testing anxiety. Um, I never got it. I, I guess I just never cared enough. <laughs> Looking back on my academic career, I just like, yeah, I'll do what I can do and get out of there. But I know people who would just freeze when it's time to take a test because the fight or flight system kicks in and you're not moving. I want you to get this. We were designed that when our body is stressed, we move. So if when you're stressed, you stay still, the damage, your blood pressure stays up. You know, your liver during these stressful ep uh, episodes actually takes glycogen and turns into glucose. So your blood sugar naturally, even if you don't eat anything, your blood sugar goes up. You know, and I showed you the slide before. When you're stressed, stress spelled backwards equals desserts, right? So you get stressed out. Now, comfort food tastes better. A brownie is going to feel much better when you're stressed out than an apple. It's designed that way by the food industry. We'll do a supplemental on that one. But I want you to understand that this will cause you to not be able to do well on tests. 
This is why exercise is so important. That's why the, the scripture says, Matthew 6, 34, take therefore no thought for the morrow, for the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. One of the reasons exercise is so good is because it brings you back to today, to now. You're worrying about what you're doing in the moment. You're hiking and you got to look where you're going to put your next foot. So you're not as worried about how you're going to pay the bills next week. That's what exercise does. It brings you back into the moment. This is one of the reasons why Jesus, and, and, and we've, there's great studies that show that if you could lecture while you walk, that's the best way to learn. And it makes sense to me. When you study the Bible, Jesus walked and taught his disciples. He walked with the two disciples on the road to Emmaus. He walked and taught because that is the best way to learn. So new report, exercise plays a key role in mental health and well-being. And uh, we kind of told you why. Physical activity interacts uh, stress uh, by increasing endorphins, which is what you get. People call it a runner's high. Makes you feel good when you work out. It's supporting cognitive function and altering blood flow to stress-affected areas of the brain. Exercise also shifts us into the present moment, focusing our attention on what we're doing right now rather than worrying about the future. So we know that physical activity, the Anxiety and Depression Association of America, physical activity reduces stress. If you are stressed in 2023, exercise. Find an exercise program to do. So exercise lowers cortisol. And here's from that article. This is what it says from the article here from um, uh, Psychoneuroendocrinology. Uh, exercise. Here's, some, here's just some bullet points. When following vigorous exercise, the HPA act, uh, at reactivity to a stressor is dampened compared to when following moderate or light activity. When following moderate exercise, HPA reactivity to a stressor is dampened compared when following light. So the more you exercise and the, the higher the concentration of your exercise, the more it turns down your ability to get that fight or flight response. You getting it? So your boss will bother you less if you exercise. And the more you exercise, the less they will bother you. Cortisol released in response to exercise is inversely related to cortisol released in response to psychosocial stressor. I hope you get that. So the more you can work out and raise your cortisol levels while you're working out in a controlled environment, the less cortisol you're going to release when your life actually attacks you. Are you getting that? It is a way to learn to buffer the stress response. So here are the conclusions of that study. This study revealed that exercise intensity dampens the HPA axis stress response in a dose-dependent manner with evidence that the cortisol release from exercising intensely suppresses the subsequent cortisol response to a psychosocial stressor. Powerful. This means gardening is good for you. Walking in the neighborhood is good for you. Going swimming is good for you because it actually prepares your body for when life really deals you a blow. And I'm starting to realize when I look at my patients that maybe this is why so many of them can't handle life. They have no reserve. They re overreact to everything. So why else is it important? Well, exercise is important for the immune system. I won't get too deep into this except to tell you uh, that one of the things that happens when you exercise is that you mobilize and improve your immune system on so many levels. Um, one of them is you bring down inflammation in the body. Um, and it does all the other things that we talked about. But exercise boosts the immune system. And one of the ways is it raises your body temperature. Naturally raises it to a comfortable level that your body can control, just like a fever, except not due to illness. So it naturally brings you up where you can fight viruses and bacteria better because you warm the body up internally, naturally. And when you sweat, this is important, there's a study that shows that when you exercise and you sweat, you actually release toxins in sweat that they can't find in urine or in other parts, in other ways that you relieve uh, uh, toxins. Exercise and sweating is one of the best uh, um, detoxing things you can do. The study showed they were looking for heavy metals, they couldn't find it in urine, they couldn't find it in the blood, they couldn't find it anywhere, but they found it in sweat. Because your body is so good at concentrating things to get out. You want to look young? Sweat. I know a lot of people don't like sweating, but it works. Exercise and heart disease, real quick, I'll show you this one. Journal of the American College of Cardiology, exercise for primary and secondary prevention of cardiovascular disease. And they show this picture here um, that shows you all the different types of exercise from resistance to moderate intensity uh, endurance to high intensity endurance. And it shows you all the different ways. I won't get into the science of it, but it actually protects uh, your body in different ways when you exercise in different ways. And 
the real lesson is here. I, I mentioned it earlier in the brain, but these are collateral vessels. This is what happens when you work out, you develop these vessels. So there's an occluded uh, vessel back over here, the circumflex artery. But if you have these collateral vessels, it's like they build tributaries around the blockage and the blood can still get where it needs to go so you don't have a heart attack. You getting this? So if you exercise, what your body does is it says, because you starve the muscle in the heart slowly of oxygen, the heart set muscle says, you know what? We're being regularly starved of oxygen. We need to build more roadways for oxygen to get to us. So over time, you build this and you build all that reserve. And this kind of shows you how that happens. The myocardial ischemia from exercise, the intravascular shear stress, triggers these things. You get angiogenesis, arteriogenesis, and then you get coronary collateral circulation, which looks like that. So you get these extra vessels to send blood around the blockage. This is what people, you go to a cardiologist and they have to put in um, 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 uh, extra vessels to get around them. They, you're going to pay a hundred and, if you had to pay out of pocket, 250, I don't know how much they charge you to open heart surgery to do this. Exercise does it for free in advance before you ever have a heart attack so you don't have a heart attack. That's the power of exercise. So it also lowers your lipids. I won't get into this, but it, it naturally lowers triglycerides, fixes the cholesterol. So a lot of people say, I can't get my cholesterol better, but they're not moving. So they're taking statins, and you know, which is the number one prescribed, I think it's still probably the number one prescribed class of drugs. But lowering your cholesterol that way does not do what exercise does. Lowers cancer risk. This is one of the most important things, um, is to know that exercise is linked with lower risk of 13 types of cancer. And part of that is because it's boost in the immune system. It's your immune system that keeps cancer at bay. So it does that through that. It also increases insulin sensitivity. So people are worried about diabetes. Exercise, when the muscles um, work so hard to have to get glucose, it actually brings down um, uh, um, uh, the blood sugar and makes you more sensitive to when you do have insulin available. Um, and the other thing exercise does I found profound is it actually makes you better use the antioxidants you eat and that your body generates. So it actually reverses aging. And so the normal aging process, these are, I think I showed you this before, these are the telomeres. The caps are like the tips on a shoelace. And as you age, it naturally goes down. And when you get to a certain point, you die. There's only a few things that actually prevent this. If you want to live longer and stronger like Moses did, you have to eat folate-rich foods. You got to get your sunshine for vitamin D and other things. Keep stress at bay. But adequate exercise is one of them. And the only thing, we'll talk about uh, in the next couple lectures, the only thing proven to actually grow the telomeres back is a whole food, plant-based diet. Only thing. Shown to actually reverse aging. So, the last one I'll talk about is um, the benefits of resistance training, weightlifting, and and push-ups and sit-ups and pull-ups and all of this kind of stuff. Resistance training is medicine. This is one article says, effects of strength training on health. And I'm just going to read the abstract from that article. Inactive adults experience a 3% to 8% loss of muscle per decade. You lose muscle. You don't want to lose muscle because muscle has high metabolism, means you can eat more food and not gain weight because your metabolism is faster. Accompanied by resting metabolic rate reduction and fat accumulation. 10 weeks of resistance training may increase lean weight by 1.4 kilograms. You want more lean weight. Increase resting metabolic rate by 7%. Increase your body's metabolism and reduce fat weight by 1.8 kilograms. The benefit, so you might, you, might, you might step on a scale and it doesn't look that different, but in fact, you're very different. Your body's sculpted different because it's muscular and not fat. Benefits of resistance training include improved physical performance, movement control, walking speed, functional independence, cognitive abilities, and self-esteem. Resistance training may assist prevention and management of type 2 diabetes by decreasing visceral fat, reducing hemoglobin A1C, increasing the density of glucose transport of type 4, and improving insulin sensitivity. Resistance training may enhance cardiovascular health by reducing resting blood pressure. Because you work the muscles, the muscles get bigger, there's more, more place for the blood that has to go, it, like plumbing, it drops your blood pressure. Decreasing low-density uh, lipoprotein cholesterol and triglycerides and increasing high-density lipoprotein cholesterol. Resistance training may promote bone development because when your muscle squeezes against your bone, it tells your bone we need to be thicker and stronger, so your body actually builds and thickens your bone, so you're less likely to get fractures, especially later in life from falls. Um, 
Resistant training may be effective for reducing low back pain because the more muscle your back has to support your body, the less likely you are to pull a, blow out a disc or, or tweak your back. Um, and easing discomfort associated with arthritis, fibromyalgia, and has been shown to reverse specific aging factors in skeletal muscle. Lifting weights. So, now, you don't have to go out there and try and be Hulk Hogan or Arnold Schwarzenegger in his prime, but just lightweight lifting or, or even just your own body weight is enough to have these effects. As we age, it's actually more important to do this. So, Ellen White, Letter 6, 1885, in order to have health, equilibrium of action must be maintained. The mind must harmonize with this or the benefits are not realized. If physical exercise is regarded as drudgery, the mind takes no interest in the exercise of the different parts of the body. Testimonies for the Church, Volume 2, page 529. Exercise will aid the work of digestion. To walk after a meal, hold the head erect, put back the shoulders, and exercise moderately will be of great benefit. Why? Because it, it changes the way blood is distributed, brings down the sugar in your blood right after you eat, and there's a lot of other reasons why it works well, but those are two of the key reasons. Testimonies for the Church, Volume 2, page 413. Exercise is important to, dis to digestion and to a healthy condition of body and mind. You need physical act exercise. You move and act as if you are wooden. She was speaking to somebody here. Um, as though you had no elasticity. Healthy, active exercise is what you need. It's our overwhelming evidence for the importance of exercise. And you don't have to start big. I tell patients, if you just do 10-minute walks, Three times a day, it's the same as if you walk 30 minutes once a day. And as you do more, your body strengthens and you can do more. And that is why exercise holds a powerful spiritual lesson. When we lift weights, one of the things that happens is your muscles rip, right? You literally shred. It's like they say in the gym. You get shredded. The muscles rip apart. But the way God designed this, he doesn't take the muscle and put it back together. What God does is he allows the space to be filled in with new muscle. That's why the muscles hypertrophy. That's why they get bigger. So the more you lift weights, the bigger the muscles get because you get, keep getting these rips. Your body heals to fill in the space. And so over time, the resistance you get in lifting weights actually gives you more muscle and makes you stronger. Here's where that gets deep. Faith works the same way. As you exercise your faith and push against the trials that this world is going to put on you, and you exercise your faith, your faith will at times be shredded, church. It'll get ripped, and you may not know what to believe. But if you stand in the presence of God and take the nutrients of his word and of prayer, and you allow the Holy Spirit to work, God doesn't take your faith and just put it back together. God allows new faith to develop, making you stronger for the next time. That's what exercise does. It prepares you in advance for the challenges ahead of you. And when you exercise your faith, the same thing happens. Exercising your faith is vital to your spiritual health. And so I want to use the, use the analogy all the way out. That's why Jeremiah says in Jeremiah 12, 5, if you have run with the footmen and they have wearied thee, then how canst thou contend with horses? If right now, you don't have the kind of faith that allows you to be faithful to God in small things. Do you really think when times of trouble come, you're going to be able to stand for God then? This is what Paul says in Hebrews chapter 12, wherefore, this is Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1, wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which do, doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. The very principles of exercise apply to your Christian walk. It is a race, and the, more, the longer you run the Christian race, the stronger you get to run the race. So Paul, at the end of his life in 2 Timothy 4, 7, says, I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. He finished the race. He started it and he finished it. None of this one saved, always saved stuff. If that was the case, Paul wouldn't say this. You've got to finish the race. That's why the Bible says a just man falls seven times and rises every time. I don't care if you've fallen before. I don't care if you fail God before. The, the principle of exercise applied to faith says if you're willing to get up and move on after your mistake, God will make you a stronger Christian because of your failure than you would have been without it. Don't use your past as an excuse not to follow God. 
It works just like muscle works, just like exercise works. The same way it prepares you for cortisol in the, in the face of real uh, psychological trauma. When you exercise your faith, when you've been spiritually traumatized or you spiritually failed, you literally grow the faith to deal with life the next time. Except now you're a stronger, wiser Christian trusting in your father. And that's why we began with this text. 1 Corinthians 9, 24. Know ye not that they which run in a race run all, but one receives the prize. So run that you may obtain. I have two cousins who've played in the NFL. One of them won a Super Bowl. Very proud of them. Um, and the other one, it was uh, my cousin Sean Taylor. Many of you remember my, the follow football. I know Sean was murdered, uh, worked, played for the then Washington Redskins. And I can tell you that when I would talk to Sean about his preparation for football season, he would start months before, like, so, you know, he'd start a few months before the football season start. He'd go out and he'd begin to run twice a day, miles at a time. He would begin to stop eating certain things. He would begin to stop, he, no, no, al he didn't ever, he was never really a drinker, but no alcohol. He, he, so many things he just would stop doing. He would focus. He'd get to bed on time. He'd wake up on time because he knew he had to get back into football shape. He would get serious because he understood it was a competition and he wanted to win. Paul is saying, and I won't use the, the, the ancient Olympics. I'll use our modern sports. Paul is saying, listen, everyone that lines up to play football at the beginning of the season, hopes to win the Super Bowl at the, at the end of the season, but only one team will win. He says, I want you to prepare for your Christian walk like they prepare for their athletic walk. He says, every man that strives for the mastery is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we are what? incorruptible. In fact, I, I can tell you my cousin Sean had a national championship ring with the University of Miami football. He had a state championship ring for the state of Florida for Gulliver Prep School. I can tell you that one day when Jesus returns, as Peter says, even the elements are going to melt with fervent heat. And it wasn't made out of the, out of the plant material that the ancient Olympiads had, um, where they wore the, 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 the crown and it, by the time they got home to their village, it was already rotten. These are made out of metal, and still they're not going to last forever. I saw this week with one of the greatest runners of all time, Usain Bolt, um, th th in Jamaica. They took $12 million out of his account. They do it to obtain a corruptible crown. What you're racing for, what you're working for, what you're exercising your faith for will never be corrupted. So he says in 1 Corinthians 9, 26, I therefore so run, not as uncertainly. So fight I, not as one that beats the air. Paul says, I'm not shadow boxing. I'm not playing around. I'm not in this Christian walk pretending to be a Christian. I'm fighting for real. You know, you all those friends, you growing up, they, trouble come, they all jumping up. Yeah, man, let's do this, let's do this. As soon as trouble comes, you look around, nobody's behind you. They just, they just play fighting. Paul says, no, I'm jumping in the fray. I'm fighting the good fight of faith. And then he says in verse 27, but I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest that by any means when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. Paul says, it's not enough to just run in place, shadow box. You've got to have movement. You've got to actually go somewhere. If you are part of this church, you went to Sabbath school and, and you were in the choir and you were in Pathfinders and you were raised great, getting these great truths and you even participate in church. Well, uh, what Paul is saying, that's not enough. He says, for that reason, I keep under my body and I bring it into subjection. Why? Because I don't want to have done all these churchly things and then be lost. In fact, the word he uses, I myself should be a castaway. The Greek word for castaway is the word adakemos. It means to be disqualified. Paul says, I don't want to have run this race and then I get at the end and I'm disqualified. And I'm challenging you, church. We are living in the last days. It is time that we take a, 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 a hard stance for the things of God. 
Never has the world had more deception, more distraction. If you're not focused with the spiritual noradrenaline and the spiritual adrenaline of the word of God and of the Holy Spirit, if you're not focused on what is important, you will be lost worrying about what the world is doing tomorrow rather than what God is doing for you right now. One of the most interesting exercise stories I have, I was working in a town called Wedowie, Alabama. Anybody ever heard of Wedowie, Alabama? I would imagine you wouldn't. I'd never heard of it. I was doing my family medicine residency in Anniston, Alabama, which you might have heard of. And um, I was, you know, trying to make some extra money. So I was going down moonlighting at the hospital down there. Um, and I'll, I'll never forget when I got there, um, it, was, it was three, it was like ten, eight bed hospital with like a two bed emergency room and a four room clinic. When I get there, they tell me, you run all of it. I said, you mean I take care of the inpatient, outpatient, the ER, the clinic? Yep. And it was, it was, it was so interesting because when you got to work, your check was sitting on the window. Because you know, nobody was there, so they would just leave your check. So you got to work. And go, I, I did like that. You pick up your check before you do the shift. That was like pretty nice. And I remember you get there, and the check is sitting there. And I, and I remember going in. And when I got there to do the first shift, they told me, they, one of the nurses pulled me aside and said, it was good to meet you. You're the first black doctor to ever work at this hospital. I said, the first one? Ever? He said, ever. Never had one before. And then one of the other nurses chimed in and said, yeah, and about two weeks ago, she said, the Ku Klux Klan marched um, in Wadawi. I said, what? In 2000 something? They still marching? They say, yeah, they marched because a, a white boy asked a half white, half black girl to the prom. I said, they didn't even go to the prom? He just asked her? Yep, they just asked. He didn't even, they didn't even get to the prom. I said, man, I'm keeping my check. I can tell you that much. I don't know what's going to happen now, but it was an interesting experience out in, the, out in what they call a dark county. No, you couldn't even, alcohol was illegal in the county. No Adventist churches in the county. And I remember meeting a, a, the rad tech, the guy who took all the x-rays, and he told me, and we, we started talking religion, and I told him I went to Oakwood and up, up north, north of here, and, uh, up there in the state, and I was an Adventist, and I kept the seven-day Sabbath. And he said, I keep the seven-day Sabbath. I said, oh, you're a seven-day Adventist? He said, no. He said, I just studied the Bible. And when I studied the Bible, I came to the conclusion that the seventh day is the Sabbath on my own. He said, there's no churches around here that keep the Sabbath, so I keep the Sabbath, and then I go to church with everybody else on Sunday. I said, man, you're a special brother. And I filed that away. I said, I'm going to need this man one day. And it came. I was working. I didn't stop working because the Klan marched. I, I, you know, I said, listen, they just got to catch me because that check being on the window was too good. So I remember one, one night I was working and um, ambulance pulled up, sirens blazing. It's a quiet little place. Normally I didn't do much of anything after the clinic closed. And they, the, 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 the ambulance pulls in. We have one uh, 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 in, uh, in cardiac arrest. She was out. And I said, what happened? They said, this woman, um, she was 42 years old. She hadn't worked out since she was a cheerleader in high school at 17. And she decided that she was going to get in shape that night. So she went to the gym to get in shape that night. So she got on the treadmill like she was still 17. And she got on the treadmill, turned all the way up, and started running full bore on the treadmill. Well, she was 42 and she'd been eating typical Alabama food and smoking cigarettes and drinking beer for the past, you know, how many years that was? 25 years or 30, 15, whatever it was. And she, she got on the treadmill and she started going three or four minutes into it. She started having crushing substernal chest pain. Eyes rolled back in her head. She passed out, collapsed, fell on the running treadmill and she was thrown off like George Jetson right onto the floor. She's laying on the floor and they call 911 and they bring her and I'm working. I said, Lord, why me? He said, cause you like that check. <laughs> and she came in and you know, my, my mind is like, listen, this is, you know, this is a real emergency and I'm hoping nothing actually happens to her because the Klan marched and I don't know who she's related to. And that, you know, so the devil started trying to put mess in your ears. So we bring her in and we hook her up to the monitor. And when we hook her up to the monitor, the monitor shows what we call tombstone signs. ST segment elevation on an EKG that says she's having an acute myocardial 
infarction. She's having a heart attack actively right in front of us. So we did everything we do. We give morphine, oxygen, nitroglycerin, and an aspirin. All while the lady's like in and out of consciousness, we do all of this. We get vital signs. They're horrible. And she's, she's literally dying, if you think about it, on the screen. So I call Birmingham to the UAB, and I, I talk to the cardiologist, and I decide I'm going to have to give her what we call clot-busting medicine, TPA. So it's dangerous to give it because if you don't have a CAT scan of the head and you give this medicine, it causes you to bleed. So if, let's say she had a stroke, a hemorrhagic stroke a year ago, and I give her this medicine, she's going to bleed out of her brain and die right in front of me. Or if she has an aneurysm no one ever found and I give it to her, the same thing could happen. But I'm stuck. If I don't give her anything, she's going to probably die for sure by the time she gets all the way to Birmingham. And so I said, we've got to give it. And the nurses were like, really? I said, yep, we're going to give it. So we gave it. And when we gave it, the, it went from the tombstone signs on the monitor. She flatlined. Whew. I said, precious Lord, take my hand. I started singing. And I turned to the guy who kept the Sabbath. I said, listen, I'm not ordering any x-rays. I need you to go back in the room and I need you to call on the name of the Lord. I need you to pray. And then I, he went in the room and started praying and I started praying. And I said, Lord, I don't care if you have to pull Lazarus. This woman's going to come out of here alive tonight, Lord. And within a few seconds, as the drug was, works the way it was supposed to work, she went to normal sinus rhythm. Perfectly normal heart rate. Perfectly normal heart waves. And I said, oh, praise the Lord. And by now, they were sending a helicopter from Birmingham to airlift her out of there. And I saw I, she, was, she woke up, and I saw her eyes open. I said, ma'am, are you okay? You having any pain? Do you need any more morphine? And the guy who came with her comes running into the room, and he says, she does not need any more morphine. This woman that was almost dead a few minutes ago sat up on the gurney and said, that man is not my husband. Give me the morphine. I said, thank you, Jesus. She's going to live. I'll tell you that story to tell you that you do not want to try and get in shape in one night, spiritually. That lady came back two weeks later after she'd done her stent and some cardiac rehab, hugged me and thanked me that we saved her life that night. I praise God for that experience because it strengthened my faith too. But the spiritual lesson is simple. I don't care what you were doing 20 years ago. I don't care how much cigarettes you smoked or drugs you did, how many nights you spent in the no-tell motel. What I'm telling you is that today you can make a decision to begin to prepare for the second coming of Jesus Christ. Right now you can do that. You can decide today. You don't have to get on the treadmill and run full bore. There's a lot to learn, a lot to do, a lot of changes your life might need. But you just got to take small steps, regular steps, and the body fearfully and wonderfully made, uh, just as the body fearfully and wonderfully made, begins to heal and rebuild, brain cells regrow, so will your faith. So I challenge you. that As we move into 2023, you exercise your body, Exercise your mind, exercise your faith. Health is in movement, and it starts with trusting God. And I want to challenge you to make this year a year where you decide, I'm going to give it all to Jesus Christ. And to close, I do want to ask, if somebody wants this year to be different than every year before, as we still are in the month of January, I want you to stand with me as I close out in prayer, that we are dedicating ourselves to exercise our faith, faith to live for Jesus Christ. We're not going to uh, uh, try and cheat God. We are going to do the work, and he will be the author and the finisher of our faith. We're going to put ourselves in a position where Jesus can take control, and we're going to live for him because we're going to believe that the blood of Jesus Christ still washes, it still cleanses. And that even if I've gone super far away from him, I've not gone so far from God that I cannot come back. And I want you to know, church, you have not out God's ability to save you. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for the lessons the scripture gives us and the prophet and leader Moses. And Father God, even before he died, he was climbing mountains. Lord, we may not be Moses, but Lord, we want to be more like Jesus. There are some in here right now, Lord, who are going through very stressful life situations, and they're not telling anyone. 
Father God, I want them to exercise their bodies. It's good for them. But Lord, help them to exercise their faith, to trust you, to understand that like that fog, Lord, you can guide them through. There are others in here, Lord, who maybe they feel they've just done too much wrong. They, they feel like they've gone too far from you. Lord, today remind them that they, Lord, have not gone so far that the long arms of your love will not reach them. And then, Father God, some of us are praying for others like we pray for ourselves and their family members, neighbors, friends who, Lord, we want them to know Jesus as their personal Savior. Lord, we pray together collectively as a church and by the power of the blood of the Lamb and, in the, and by the power of the Holy Ghost that those loved ones would feel the love of Christ and return to him or come to him if they don't know him. That is our prayer for 2023, that, Lord, we would be fit vessels to be used in finishing this work. This is our prayer in Jesus' precious and holy name. Let the church say amen, amen. and amen. And you may remain standing for the closing hymn.